sites across the developing world are actually very little addressed by inventory efforts. Uh, so we get two immediate payoffs. Knowledge of occurrence of species of conservation concern. So a good, well-documented inventory, even if there aren't any specimens, may detect a species of conservation concern, something that's endangered, something that's declining. And that can be an immediate impetus for conservation, interact, uh, conservation action. And we get the, the more basic detail about each species and the overall suite of species. So for example, with a bunch of colleagues from Mexico, um, I worked in this region called the Chimalapas uh, in southern Mexico. And notice, a high priority region for bird conservation in Mesoamerica. Well, the, Atlantic o the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean are here, and the Pacific Ocean is here, and this is called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And I was always told that the isthmus was a lowland barrier that separated montane areas in Oaxaca from montane areas in Chiapas, okay? And it wasn't until I kind of went in by accident that I realized it was also a huge 400,000 hectare virgin rainforest. Yeah, an amazing place. I don't have pictures of it for you just because um, my slides are uh, from this work. My slides are all uh, in analog format and I haven't yet scanned them. Huh? Data security. Yeah, data security, exactly. Uh, vegetation types, you can see most of the Chimalapas region is tropical rainforest. And in this uh, publication, you know, important species present in the region include harpy eagle, um, black and horned guans, scarlet macaw. Essentially what we're doing is we're pointing out all of the threatened and endangered species that we documented for the region. Chima Chimalapas avifauna is by far the most diverse for any region of comparable size, at least 464 species, etc., etc. Now, we would dearly love to see this place turn into literally the, the, the crown jewel of Mexican tropical protected areas. It hasn't yet, and it's a very interesting situation. The state border between Chiapas and Oaxaca runs like this. And about 40 years ago, Chiapas decided to take a little bit more of Oaxaca. And so there's a miniature civil war that's been going on for a long time. I didn't know about it, walked into it, ended up with a gun pointed to my head at three separate points. It was not the most fun field work that I've done. But the local people who are from Oaxaca are very willing to create a, essentially a community forest that would be very well protected, but the one thing they're asking is that the government resolve those problems of, of state borders and land tenancy. And the state governments have not resolved that problem and so it's sitting there. Here's another example, one a little bit closer to where we are. Um, vast and underestimation of Madagascar's biodiversity evidenced by an integrative amphibian inventory. And so essentially here they're doing perhaps more inventory at a regional level, but what they're doing is they're questioning the, the species level taxonomy. Maybe you guys hate this paper or love this paper, uh, but at least on some of both? Okay, good. Um, but essentially what they're doing is, is detecting uh, very poorly known, or very, very, sorry, they're very distinct lineages that may not have a name. And essentially then they turn, so these are some examples that they point out, and then they turn that into a series of recommendations about um, conservation priorities across Madagascar. Again, I'm moving fast. <coughs> Faunal change, or floral change, sorry. Biotic change. Um, we can do this in two directions. And ideally, we'd do it in two directions at the same time. 
we can go out and do inventories now and we can do them at inventory we can do our inventories at sites that have already been surveyed and you guys can come back and do them 10 years 20 years 30 years into the future so we can we can do these very simple studies that are perhaps retrospective so for example here's our own dear Mark Robbins okay and he led an expedition to this place Abra Maroncunca in Peru and it was a place where this colleague of ours Tom Schulenberg and this now deceased colleague Laurie Binford they had been there 30 years ago and so these were people working at the same institution or, or at least people from the same institution we have the old specimens and the new specimens and we have the field notes and so this is the site here's Peru this is the Pacific Ocean this is Bolivia and this site is right here almost on the Bolivian border and you can see a, a little bit of a, of a satellite image that's what the site looks like okay well they came home and they realized that the set of species that they detected a couple years ago was very different from the set of species that had been detected 30 years before so they appealed to one of my graduate students Andres Lira Noriega who is an expert with satellite imagery and Andres did a very simple classification into forest non-forest and so the gray area the dark gray areas are forested the light gray areas are non-forested and this is 1987 and 2009 we weren't able to go farther back to when the original survey was really done just because 87 was the limit of usable imagery so this gets back to your question about about um, early images and detecting change but what you can see is that the forest has been pushed back look especially along this line there's a lot more non-forested habitat and so a lot of what they found were open country birds essentially intruding into areas that had been forested I'm not going to go into the details and then this is something that I did actually before I'd met Rafe but it was my my first entry into the Philippines working on this mountain called Mount Katanglad um, and essentially I went in in 1992 and worked for two solid months on this mountain and some of my colleagues who are uh, bird watchers uh, went in subsequently several Filipinos went in on essentially the second of a pair of expeditions I'd gone in on the first uh, some colleagues from the US a colleague from Austria which is to say we assembled from around the world all the people who had worked on this mountain and then there were old specimens from probably the 1950s from a, a professional collector who worked across the Philippines and I don't have good graphics to show you this and I don't have change we I didn't know how to do the satellite imagery work yet but essentially you're seeing this chunk right here right here um, that's Mount Katanglad those are the highland areas that's the forest remaining and you can see it's one of the nicer chunks of forest across the island and then you can see um, the field museum sites and so I worked these three sites that was in 1992 in 1993 this was good forest that was quite accessible for 92 but you can see that the highest parts of the mountain range were far away from us so in 1993 they went to a different site over here but then the Austrians were over here and the bird watchers were kind of cruising around the whole mountain range and well you can see our accumulation curves and I'll, I'll we'll go into that tomorrow you can see trends across elevation um, and then sorry again textually you can see changes and I'll just summarize it that um, because the old and the new specimen series went in different times of the year 
Some saw different migratory species than others. There was a component of, of large raptors that was mostly lost from the new surveys, et cetera, et cetera. But we were able to explore how the avifauna had changed over 40 or 50 years. So probably the best single example of this is the Grinnell Project. Now, what have you heard, especially Kate, talk about this guy Grinnell? What did he do? He invented a system of field notes. And guess what? Because Grinnell and all of his students and all of his associates had to use this system, this project became possible. So that's Grinnell. Um, and over the, the beginning of the 20th century, Grinnell led major surveys over large chunks of the state of California. I think the earliest sites were the ones down here, and then later he came up into this region. Like 1906, I know he was working in this region, and it was by the 20s that he was into the Central California region. And these were big projects, they were very well documented, they had photographers going along. Um, essentially, there's one of the field teams, okay? And they, they look just as ugly as Mark Robbins, right? Um, and guess what? Before and after habitat photos. There's what it looked like. I think I covered up the, the date, sorry. And here's what it looks like now. And so maybe you can see some growth in the, in the forest stands. And they, they do, there's a whole series of, of papers presented analyzing this. Um, here's another site. Again, you can see growth in these stands. Okay, you can see a little bit of change in the cars also. Um, another site. So then these papers, they start producing these papers that take some of the best transects that go from very low areas to very high areas. I think it's low to high. Um, between 1914 and 1920, Grinnell and colleagues surveyed the mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians across central California from the floor of the San Joaquin Valley to Mono Lake on the east side of the Sierra Nevada. So it's actually going up and over the Sierras. This early survey provides the vast majority of available knowledge of the fauna of the park. Original survey involved 957 day, person days of field work. Get this, data archived at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology includes some 2,000 pages of detailed field notes. Think about how many late nights that involves of you sitting up and writing notes before you fall asleep. 817 photographs and 2,795 specimens. Grinnell and Tracy Storer published the collected efforts of this field work in animal life in, of, in the Yosemite, um, 1924, et cetera, et cetera. So in collaboration with the National Park and the US Geological Survey, with financial support from da da da, da Museum of Vertebrate Zoology resurveyed the Yosemite transect to provide updated information on species distributions <laughs> and on habitat and community changes over the past century. So Cameroonians, I see a transect right here that in and of itself is really interesting. But if you link it to data collected 10, 50, 100 years ago, it becomes really interesting. Um, so this is a paper, you can see it was published in one of the most prestigious journals, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This paper is in the readings uh, folder that we've passed around. Um, they did some really interesting things where they tracked changes in climate between the two time periods. And so look at the color codings of this blue and this blue, this brown and this brown this green and this green, et cetera. But what you can see, just plotting in terms of precipitation versus temperature, you can see, for example, that these sites, which I assume are Lassen, 
These sites didn't change in temperature at all, but they got substantially wetter. Whereas, for example, these sites are changing mostly in temperature, and these sites are changing simultaneously in precipitation and temperature. Okay, so that's real 1920 to 2000 climate change. And then they looked at how species were tracking or not their climatic niche footprints, and that was based on the old specimen records and the new specimen records. Again, there's a whole series of papers. This is in Trends in Ecology and Evolution, um, detecting rain shifts from historical species occurrences. And I put this in mainly because you can imagine a whole, if I have old and new, let's say we do this for Mount Cameroon, if we get only presence data, presence and, well, I have presence of this species and non-detection. I didn't see it. Well, that's going to be pretty hard to decide. Was it not seen because of lack of effort or some data leak in the digital accessible knowledge chain? Or is it not detected because it wasn't there? But then you have situations where you have some data that will allow you to guess at how probable it is that the absence is true absence. And then with abundance data, you can do still better, usually. And so just to give you one example of that, um, this is a shrew. Um, and it looks like it's on the Yosemite transect. But essentially what you see is historical probability of occupancy and modern probability of occupancy. And you can see that the shift, you can see a shift of several hundred meters in elevation over that 80 year period. And it's very interesting because this is kind of what you expect. And other species shifted the other way. Okay, so it's not just simply, okay, climate is getting warmer, so we're going to move our way up the mountain. It can be much more complex than that. That's why you do these studies and instead of just give your theories. So just to sum up, and then I'll pass this on to Rafe and Dave, uh, inventory data are more valuable, more information rich, and more re rewarding scientifically than found data or ad hoc data. We can certainly get economy of scale and cost effectiveness. The amount of money per specimen or per data record that you will spend will generally be lower because you're not moving, you're not changing your campsite. It's simply easier. It also simplifies describing the habitat. All of those habitat photographs become much easier per specimen when you collect 100 specimens there instead of one, okay? And so essentially, uh, where we lose by doing inventories, instead of just scattering, is in that we get fewer sites across the landscape with information. 